two-part documentary delves into the world of Irish dance and experiences the extreme discipline and dedication it takes to be part of this growing global sport. As we journey with dancers from Ireland, England and America, we look beyond the fake tan and wigs. I think it looks ridiculous. We also witness the highs and lows of each competitor as they battle it out to be the best. The world title is everything in Irish dancing. I have so much pressure to retain the title. I don't want to lose it. Although it was originally founded by the Gaelic League in 1883, it was 100 years later when the explosion of river dance turned Irish dancing into an overnight phenomenon. Following the success of touring shows, Irish dancing is now recognised as one of the fastest growing global sports. One of the most outward changes that's visible to us is the whole notion of the World Championships, which moved from like Colosh to Wirra, where it could be housed in a school in Dublin, to now not only being housed in Ireland, but also being housed overseas, attracting thousands of competitors. When I won the Worlds was back in 75, and um, it was at the Mansion House, and it was a very prestigious event, it was a beautiful event, it was a completely different sort of a competition those days, it was much smaller, it's much bigger now, and much more glamorous. City West welcomes the 2011 Irish Dancing World Championships back to Dublin for the first time in 15 years. During this time, the County Dublin Resort will welcome over 4,000 competitors along with their 40,000 spectators. It's become an entire, you know, 10-day festival and, and people are still buying into it and they're preparing it for the whole year. In the run-up to the main event, workers from all corners of the country spend an intense week building three huge dancing stages. Unlike most competitors, Galway girl Claire Greeny is carrying enormous pressure ahead of this year's Worlds. Uh, Claire um, has won the Worlds for the last four years, since 2007, so she's going for five in a row this year, which is uh, a big feat. I oh, have so much pressure to retain the title, because it's pressure I put on myself, because I don't want to lose it. Bum, 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 bum. Yeah, I'm not hearing the, the last pop, pop, bang. It's very hard to be happy with second when you've had first yeah. for so long. If I don't win the world, it's not the end of the world, but I will be devastated. Oh, yeah. A little bit more to show it off. Yeah, you don't need to do it quite as fast as you're doing it. It's not quite that speed. So get your da diddly done to start before you do those skips as well. She wants to stay at the top now, and uh, she'll do her very best to stay up there. I think Claire deserves to be where she is. When she's on fire, when she's on, the, on her best, I think she's hard to beat. An up-and-coming name on the Dublin dance scene is Jack Quinn, who spends seven days a week training for this year's Worlds. Jack won the All-Irelands this year, so it probably would, it gives him the enthusiasm and it gives him the encouragement to actually face the world now and uh, hope for, for, for the best. I'm excited, like, all I can do is just dance my very best and then after that, what can I do? He's up against uh, a lot of very stiff competition, some great boys in it, you know. So, you know, whatever happens, happens. Uh, we, we look forward to great things. But if it doesn't happen for him, well, we it just... It doesn't happen this year. We just hope it will happen in maybe another in the future. Dublin-born but US-based Carl Drake has flown home with students from his school, which is based in Atlanta, Georgia. He's crossing! Come on, lift him up, come back! Up, up. I actually have 23 kids here competing at the World Championships. Most of the kids are here for the first time. I hold high hopes for one particular dancer, Katie Foley. Hi. <laughs> I'm hoping it's a very happy and exciting day for her. Katie, Carl's shining star, arrives one week later than the rest of her school. I'm traveling alone because usually I travel with my dance teacher. It's hard for my mom to come with me, the expense from flying over from America. Um, but also we've had family troubles the last couple of years, so it's a little stressful to leave right around now. So I couldn't come with my teacher and I'd come on my own this time. Sometimes when I'm stressed with everything going around in the environment at home, I don't dance to my fullest, so hopefully this time I'll do that. If I won, that'd be awesome. <laughs> but uh, just doing my very best and um, getting some good points would be, that would make me happy. While Katie leaves the airport, thousands of people gather for the opening ceremony in City West. Inside the convention center, a guard of honor assembles ahead of the president's arrival. 
The Irish tenors also add to the excitement and take centre stage to set the afternoon off on a high note. dancers dreams just to make it to the world and to compete at the world when a dancer first qualifies to go to the world championship it is quite a big deal because it's sort of the last level and then at that stage then you're, you're you know you're, you're in the ring with the big guys and, and and it's 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 a case of fighting out for the title at that stage the competition gets harder every year because everyone just wants to be at the very top the pinnacle is to, is to qualify for the World Championships and hopefully eventually win the World Championships. So that is the, the sort of supreme aim of every competitive Irish dancer. It is all about being a world champion. That matters an awful lot to people. The kind of prestige of having that world title and knowing that if you have that title that people consider you the best in the world, um, that's just, it's enough really. No money and thing is needed really just to have that title is amazing. Desperate to have her time with the title is American teen Katie Foley. After a long flight, she's delighted to see Carl's familiar face. So the flight was okay? It was okay. Yeah. yeah. So do you like the venue? Yeah, I like the venue. The stage is really big. Um, you're, not on the big stage? you're not on the big stage, but I'm That's actually fine. really happy That's about fine. that. I think it'll really suit you. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you? It's, uh, Although Katie has only just arrived in City West, she immediately starts intensive training. The jet lag definitely has an effect on them, and most of my dancers came two or three days ahead of time to practice and adjust to the time difference. Katie is still on US time, so she'll have to adjust quickly if she's to dance her best tomorrow. from Manchester's Lally School also hold high hopes for their dancers in this year's Worlds. The most stressful thing probably about the Worlds is you've got, you, you know kind of the ability of all your dancers that are there. You're really hoping that they, when they get up to dance that they do the, the best they can do and, and as good as you've seen them probably dancing in class. Some of our dancers will have really high expectations. Lally School dancer Jessica Hindley is also dancing in the under 19 age group competing against Katie Foley. We'll be delighted if she can get up there and do dance her best. There's other children who will, will be wanting to recall, other children that will be wanting to medal. Some of them are going for the experience. So um, you're dealing with all the children and all their, their parents' expectations as well. So um, fortunately enough, we're blessed by having children who are very realistic about their own expectations and so are their parents. While Katie perfects her routine, Jessica gets fired up for competition time in the main practice area. I think it takes a number of things to be a world champion. If you can get a child who has ability 
and talent and they are willing to work and they have parents who are willing to get them to the class every week and are supportive, then you've got a winning combination. Coming up, Jack's dance comes to a sudden stop and Jessica and Katie go head to head. But this sport isn't without dangers. At 6am, it's an early start for Jack, but on the day of competition, he's raring to go. I'm looking forward to getting out there and dancing well. I'm feeling good today, so I just hope for the best. Inside the hall, the under-13 competition gets underway. The mornings of competitions, you, you have to warm up and you have to have stretched, and then you can kind of do a tiny bit of practice and then and you have to put it out in the stage. With just minutes to his calling time, Jack does some final preparations for his first round of competition and takes to the stage hoping to outdance his rivals. There's a tiny bit of nerves all the time. Everyone has a bit of nerves. It wouldn't be normal if you didn't. The best thing to do is just forget about them because it will take your energy out of you completely and you just, you, you won't dance or perform well at all. Warmed up and wished well, Jack begins his first round of competition. With the first round down, Jack seems happy with his performance and waits for the second round. <coughs> to ease any stresses or strains, dancers can escape the heated competition halls and unwind at the festival's carnival. Although only a stone's throw away, the atmosphere in the games room and competition halls are light years apart. In the Sycamore Suite, we witness the intensity of competition time as rivals Jessica and Katie prepare to go head to head. First of the two to take to the stage is Jessica. Yeah, I was feeling good, a bit nervous, but it's always nervous when the first warming up and everyone's panicking. The preparation for today has been probably better than than her last few majors. Yes. Um, she's in form, she feels good about it. Um, there really isn't much more she can do, to be honest. While Jessica reruns some steps, Katie has other things on her mind. No, to get this ready, <laughs> I woke up at six, so everything. Hopefully we'll stay on for the set dance. I did do my own makeup. <laughs> um, when I was younger, my mom used to do my hair and makeup, and I, I'm just very independent with everything, so I taught myself how to do it based on her because she used to be really good at it. Um, I just wanted to do it on my own, which is good because now she can't come with me to competitions. It's too hard, so I miss my mom a lot. I, mean, I wish she was here, but sometimes you just have to face the challenges alone and try to keep in contact the best you can, so. Okay, we go upstairs then. And Are we going to come too? Yeah, I go up to you. In last minute preparations before she goes on stage, Jessica applies what most dancers refer to as their most essential necessity. There's the whole phenomenon of sock glue, which when I first heard of, I thought I was totally misunderstanding the person who, who told me about the sock glue phenomenon. But basically it's something that they, the girls use to keep the socks positioned on their shin so that they don't slip down while they're dancing and obviously cause a distraction to the footwork. Finally ready to go, Jessica gets some last minute advice. It's on me, I'm harder than you've done in the last years and years and years and years and years, okay? If they're connected to you, that is all the difference, okay? Make them love you as soon as you go for. <laughs> Breaking away from her family and friends, Jessica makes her way to the main stage. We as a kind of Western society really buy into competition with this disposition 
that we get a thrill out of being the best of something or uh, the new thing now is have a, a personal best. It makes life very exciting but it's also, it also has the potential to be quite unhealthy. You may love or hate competition, but it's a necessary evil. Without it, none of us would have the standard of dancing that we have today. No matter how close you are with your opposition or that you get along really well, it does get very competitive, more so than people think. We're delighted with her, with what, how she actually danced, we're very, very, very pleased, so, but we're also prepared to be disappointed because... <laughs> really? Yeah, I don't think that happened, but she, I don't think she could have done any better. I felt really good, um, nervous, but just wanted to get it all done and just do, do my best, really, after all the practice. Everything went to plan and no slips or anything, which is the main thing. The competition was really good and uh, everyone was amazing. They've all practiced so hard. You don't you never know what's going to happen, so I'll be nervous when, once I'm sat there waiting. While Jessica wishes for a good result, rival Katie relies on regular routine to battle her way through backstage nerves. My good luck ritual before I go on stage is I always say a prayer right before I go on, just in my head, not a lot or anything, and I always wear my ring, so it, hopefully it's good luck. Sometimes, you know, it just keeps me from breaking my leg. I'm not like <laughs> all the time like reading the Bible or anything, but I go to church every Sunday with my family. Um, I'm Catholic, so. <laughs> a little bit Irish in me. <laughs> there can be a lot of pressure in Irish dancing. I do think sometimes parents and teachers are, um, are very motivated on behalf of the dancer. Some of the parents can put a lot of pressure on children. I've seen over the years where where the parents are more interested in the child achieving than the child themselves. If a dancer seems to have what it takes to be a champion, um, you'll get a lot of people pushing them. But I find a lot of dancers want to do it anyway. They actually really believe in it. What you'll find is, even if the dancer achieves a high standard at a young age, they burn out pretty quickly because the pressure gets too much. So ultimately, if the pressure is not coming from the dancer themselves, the longevity of, the, of that dancer's career is, is going to be quite short. That's all I can ask for. The competition was very, very stiff today. Yeah. Some uh, fantastic dancers. So, just hope for the best. Well, I just got on stage. I was so nervous to go up there. I was shaking because no one else had done the planks to here yet. But it went well. So, I'm really happy with it. I was really nervous about the timing, but I think I, I hit it on. So, lots of work paid off. I'm really, really, really happy with it. Although the competition continues, Jessica and Katie have completed their rounds. So for them, the waiting game begins. Besides the carnival, another attraction at City West is the shops. Craig Cousins began fitting shoes at the tender age of seven. In 95, he designed the first shoe to protect Irish dancers, and within two years, 80% of the top dancers worldwide were wearing the hooligan shoe. It's important to always remember that the most important tool that the dancer has are the shoes. Compared to the dress, it's actually probably one of the cheapest parts of the outfit. I Dance Irish is another stall attracting lots of attention. Along with the many Irish cultural items they sell, wigs are one of the most popular products on their shelves. 
A lot of children are opting to go with bun wigs now because of the elegance of it. So a lot of children don't want big, big wigs. There's a lot of subjectivity in it as well and what looks good on a child. So we have a lot of children that are opting to put their hair up, put the bun wig on. We would have other children that would go for shorter wigs. We've got other ones that love them really long. There's a lot of choice there for kids as well. The whole idea of curling the hair comes from the old Irish tradition of the Sunday best. And it was very important for a family to sort of make a good presentation in the community at Mass on Sunday, so the mothers would curl the girls' hair to make it look like there was an effort put in and to make them look neat. And I think that's sort of where the, the whole curling of the hair came from. Curls bounce, therefore the dancer looks livelier, so you get this kind of um, optical illusion, so th th they seem to be a lot more uh, alive, and then th that equates to better dancing. And you're thinking, well, the poor girls have to go to Mass with the rollers in, how about we go down the wig thing, and, and they don't have to go to through the torture of wearing rollers at night. It's really just a convenience thing. Obviously, at times, some people don't get the less is more concept, and some of the wigs have been quite outrageous. But I think when, when the bigger wigs, when so, if somebody appears wearing a bigger wig, um, it, it can look quite comical, and they soon revert to wearing something that looks somewhat more realistic and natural. While the wigs might create an optical illusion for the girls, unfortunately, there are no accessories to aid the under-13 boys. Jack takes to the stage au naturel and hopes having his best foot forward will carry him through as he dances his second round of competition. Unfortunately, not everything goes to plan. The dance comes to a sudden stop as the other competitor has hurt his foot. While Jack shows concern for him, the supporters worry if the interruption will kill off any hope of high points. After the break, Claire gets ready to defend her title for the fifth year, but she'll need to impress the judges who are out for blood. I wouldn't like to be performing today. I wouldn't like to be up on the stage dancing today. Before the break, Jack's second round was interrupted with his competitor tripped and hurt himself. Now they return to the stage and pick up from where they had left off. Adjudicators, we now return to competitors 144 and 145. Having danced the last 16 bars without any mishaps, Jack hopes the interruption doesn't come between him and the title. I was very happy with it. Very happy. Yeah, yeah, very happy. Glad it's all relieved. Having danced his best, the waiting game begins for Jack and all of his family. Early riser Claire has been up before 5 this morning, preparing for her first dance at 8 a.m. What time is Jim and Deirdre? I don't like to be rushing, putting on my wig and putting on my makeup and everything like that. Like at a normal fetch, it might only take me 20 minutes to a half an hour to do all makeup and hair, but on the day of the worlds, you take more time. Um, so it'll probably take me up to about an hour. Ahead of her dance, Claire warms up and stretches out before making her way to the main competition hall. There's so much pressure when you're when you have a world title behind you and then you're going for the next one. For me, the more I win, the more nervous I get because the more you win, the more people are expecting you to win, if that makes sense. So, like, everybody has an off day, but if you go out at a competition and you have an off day and people are expecting you to be amazing because you're the world champion, they're going to be looking at you saying, kind of, how did you ever win the worlds? You know, they're, just, they're always expecting you to be as good as they expect you to be, but sometimes you just kind of can't really deliver all the time so that just puts a lot of pressure and then the worry that you're not going to deliver and that you're not going to be as good as you want and then there's always the pressure of you've won it before but what happens if you go down and then somebody else takes the title off you and then you're kind of left with not winning so that's there's just so much pressure and so much stress that you put on yourself.
conference center is buzzing with the activity of dancers and spectators. And in the competition hall, Claire finds some relief in her lucky charm, Pooh Bear. I've never lost when I've had him with me, so I have to bring him everywhere with me now. So he just sees in the bag there and he goes everywhere. So he's been to many places. As the competition continues and Claire's calling time draws closer, we see how she's feeling. As I get older, you kind of just have to try and control them and put them away, block them out. Fingers crossed it'll all go well. Backstage, the under-21 girls are getting ready for their first time before the judges. Claire uses a trick of the trade to help prepare for the stage. Just the sugar in the coke kind of makes it a bit more rougher and stickier, so that when you go up on stage that your shoes aren't shiny and slippy. Lucasade or Ribena or anything is probably better, but that's just the job too. And the sticky. As teachers, we just want everything to go okay for them. No slips, no trips, no bumps, you know. Um, and that's, that's all you can ask for, really. Anything can happen on the day. Like, you could be dancing absolutely brilliantly, but you could trip or you could just go blank and forget your step. And if that happens, you're gone and there's nothing you can do about it. And, like, you only have a few minutes to impress, so anything can happen in those few minutes. So the worry of actually losing that title is just very stressful. When you're performing, it's hard to describe really because anything can be going through your head. You could spot some, someone in the audience and then you kind of focus on them. A lot of people think you're thinking of your steps or anything like that. You're not. Your steps are in your head. Um, so steps aren't an issue. Kind of Generally, all your work is done, so really it's in your legs. If it's not in your legs, you're generally not going to think, oh, I have to turn this foot out or this foot has to get higher than whatever. Do you mean it's generally in there? So. I couldn't actually tell you a lot of the time what does go through my head when I'm dancing because it's, a lot of the time it's just a blur. Like I walk off the stage and think, I don't even know what the dance was like, I don't know how it felt, do you know what I mean? You kind of just don't know yourself. It's very, very hard to describe what would be going through your head. I got it perfect. Yeah, and I got your shoot out. As the competition continues, we learn what it takes to be the best. When you're performing a competition, there's an awful lot at stake. You cannot make one mistake, and the material you're doing probably is you know, very, very athletic and very virtuosic. So it is, it's a different sort of a pressure, but the feeling of actually nailing something is an amazing feeling, but it's kind of short-lived because you may have nailed it, but your judges may have thought somebody nailed it better than you, so you know you mightn't get the place that you feel like you deserve. If I lost to somebody, I'd be fine if I felt they deserved it um, or that I didn't dance my best. If she dances really well and she deserves it, she'd be disappointed if she didn't get it. But hopefully that won't happen. <laughs> Throughout this week-long festival, each competition sees over 100 dancers battling it out to be the best. To the untrained eye, these dancers might appear to be equally good, but the experts know exactly how to differentiate them. I'm not sure that the untrained eye would immediately recognize a natural dancer or be able to pinpoint and say, that dancer obviously has really good natural ability, that dancer's practiced a lot. However, I think the untrained eye will find the performance of a natural dancer more enjoyable because they will be somewhat more relaxed. And that doesn't mean they'll be any less energetic or any less athletic in their performance. You just won't see the hard work. Those dancers who are really quite spectacular come up with brilliant new things. And I love that because I think it's, it, it, that dance is about being expressive and saying something, trying to say something or giving people an opportunity to see the world the way you see it. I love Ireland. Like Irish dancing has always been part of the culture and a lot of people feel that it's gone away from that. But for me, it's all still on the same basics and same traditions and everything. So to me, it's still a big part of Ireland's culture. After dancing her second round, Claire waits to be recalled while we discover what exactly the adjudicators are looking for. In terms of adjudicating, it's very interesting because people have their own preferences in terms of subjectivity, but there's also an agreed criteria of what makes a good dancer. First and foremost would be timing and rhythm, especially in the hard shoe dancing. That's all about making the beats, 
making them clear and crisp and making them in time with the music. Above that, we also have posture. There is a misconception that, that Irish dancers should be very, very tight-shouldered and very constrained. If they do that, you're going to see all the stress of the hard work coming out on the face, on the neck, and possibly with movement of the shoulders. So ideally the adjudicator is going to look for a relaxed posture where the arms are just relaxed neatly at the side of the body. So the arms don't move, but they're not tense either. Sue Faye Healy has travelled home from Ottawa in Canada to adjudicate at this year's Worlds. It's very interesting uh, competition today, lots of lovely rhythm in the competition. When you see the dancers come out for the first time, you're excited and you're looking for some nice, real, natural talent. I usually look for uh, nice turned out feet, nice footwork, you're looking for a nice carriage, you're looking for a nice posture. Presentation is very important, the, the nice length of a dress and uh, the colours on the dancer, it's just part of it, it's not the, it's not the be and all end of it, like you know, the costume is part of the dancer. We mark immediately because you'd forget, you forget very quick what that dancer was like, so you're, you put down your mark as soon as they leave the stage. The toughest part of the day is um, when you have a few in your mind that you really love. You have to make up your mind whether it's a half mark or a quarter of a mark between these dancers. I wouldn't like to be performing today, I wouldn't like to be up on the stage dancing today. Claire has a tough time battling her nerves as anxiety levels reach an all-time high. In a final attempt to impress the judges, she takes to the stage and provides her spectators with the ultimate A-class performance. I'm feeling a lot of pressure just to, because um, you know, you're the one to beat, because you've won it the last four years, so everybody's kind of like, everybody, when I come out on stage, everybody's like, that's the world champion. So they're expecting you to be really good, and you, like, obviously you never want to lose your title. Um, and even if you do lose it, you'll, you'll, you'll always have your title there, but kind of you're going to go the year knowing that someone else bet you the last time. So it is a lot of pressure to just pray that it's actually going to be okay. While the crowd give an echoing applause, the judges remain poker-faced. Still to come, tensions rise as the contestants prepare for disappointment. The results they've all been waiting for are finally revealed. Whatever happens, happens. Yes. Take him on the chin. After dancing two rounds, Jack was invited to the recall round where he performed for his third and final time. Hoping to have outshone the rest, he waits nervously on the results. They're due out about 8 pm, so we're waiting. Just a bit nerve wracking now, this stage. Whatever happens, happens. Yes. Taken on the chin. I was feeling nervous about it. Just, right, the results is the hardest part now, just waiting on the. Come up on the road and see what way it goes, like you know, hopefully it goes the right way. Fingers crossed. Each judge can give a maximum of 100 points per round. Although there are five judges marking each dance, the highest and lowest scores are disregarded. Because of this, the most a dancer can expect to receive per round is 300 points. Tensions rise higher as Jack's number 145 draws nearer. 94-91. Scoring the highest points in the entire first round, Jack's off to a great start. While the excitement proves too much for some, the Quins anxiously await the second round of results. After reaching an amazing 275 in the second round, Jack's success continues in the third when he gets 285 points. The total marks of each round combined give the Quins even further reason to celebrate.
Like when it comes to Irish dance, it's fantastic, and he really, he really makes it for himself. <laughs> I'm really, really, really happy. Oh, I just can't explain it. It's, it's so brilliant. I don't know if anyone can ex ever expect anything like this. Oh, I just can't explain it. It's so brilliant. Jack makes his way to the stage as the under 13 world champion to collect his trophy. While the O'Shea's are ecstatic to join in on the honour of Jack's win, the Lally teachers are fighting optimism. This is the, the worst part, um, because if they, especially if they've done well and they get a bad result, so you're just preparing yourself to, to be excited or disappointed. So it's the worst part because your moods could be ranged from one thing to another, so you just hope that she gets what she deserves. Obviously it's very nerve-wracking for the child as well um, as us. Everything's done now, she's danced really well. But it's tough, so we'll either be happy or disappointed, I suppose. I'm really nervous. <laughs> never know what's going to happen. It's exciting, but at the same time, it's really nerve-wracking because everything, all the weeks of training, just comes down to this. I'm really happy with how I've done, so just see how the results go. Sitting a few feet away and fighting for the same trophy is Katie Foley. I'm really nervous right now because you just don't know. It could be really bad. Not as nervous as my mom at home. She sent me so many text messages. She's like, news, results? And I was like, no, not yet. She's like, I think I may throw up. I'm definitely too old for this. Voice first. Great. <laughs> How are you? So funny. I don't think that my first mark is going to be very good. So I'm, I'm the most nervous about the first round. In a bid to be the best, Jessica's nerves have numbed her. As the results of round one and two roll in, her reaction gives nothing away. Number one, four, seven, Number one, While the Lally dancers listen attentively for their rivals' results, Katie puts herself into panic mode. In the hope of building a distance between herself and her nerves, Katie busies herself by recording the results. Unknown to Katie and Carl, she is totaling the wrong numbers. While Katie prepares herself for ultimate disappointment, Jessica scores a total of 490. This is a personal best and puts her in third place. As the fourth, fifth and sixth places are announced, Katie realises her calculations were wrong. In eighth place was number 179, Katie Foley. While Katie spreads her good news on placing 8th and not 27th, Jessica shares her delight. Very happy. Well, the best I've done before is 5th. She works so unbelievably hard. hard. She's such an inspiration to the younger children that we have in our class because I can turn around at every single lesson and say, that's why she wins all the time, because she's over there practicing on her own. If I tell her to go and practice something a thousand times, she'll stay there and do it a thousand times. And that's why she's here today, like, done so well. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. You can only... So many things can go wrong on the day. And to be top five is amazing, but to be top three, plus you get one of the, one of the globes. Um, it's great. It's brilliant for her. I'm delighted for her. I couldn't be happier, really. 
basking in their newfound glory, the girls go backstage and Jessica receives her third place sash. The cups that are, you're being presented with are your cups, so take them down off the stage with you, okay? After when some final finish. pointers, Jessica prepares to walk on stage as the third best under-19 dancer in the world. Shortly after, Katie makes her debut. We actually didn't know she was coming in eighth place until they actually calculated and brought it up on the screen. So we were shocked. It added actually to be exciting. It was so exciting because it was like 38. Okay. We actually must. What we were doing was we were looking at the number before you. So happy to be in the top ten in the world again. And I'm really proud of you. I'm thrilled. Absolutely thrilled. It's great for them to go home with the globe because they can see that every morning when they wake up and they think, I'm going to get that again next year. Bigger. <laughs> bigger. <laughs> bigger. Yeah. While the under-19 girls go their separate ways to celebrate their new rankings as world champion dancers, there's still one dancer waiting in suspense. They're going to be out now shortly and feeling the nerves. But uh, it's been a long wait, but hopefully we'll be all right. You're excited, but you're just anxious. But sure, you're going to be nervous when you're trying to retain a title and you're so close to knowing whether you have or you haven't. So um, it's very nerve-wracking, but everyone around me kind of keeping me calm and composed and everything, so you have to remain positive. So I feel I dance well enough to retain the title, um, but you just don't know what the judges, whether they're going to actually go with you, if they like you or not. So I'm still hoping to win it again, but if I don't, I don't. So I mean, so there's nothing really I can do about it now. Claire's highly anticipated wait is almost over, and while she attempts to block out the buzzing hall, the results announcer asks for attention. Surrounded by her supporters, the Hessian school dancers are anxiously hoping to hear high points as they wait for Claire's number 186. 178, 38. 180, 80.5. 186.225. After scoring 225 points out of a possible 300, Claire will require higher points if she's to retain her title. With tensions high, a resounding hush sweeps through Claire's supporters ahead of the second round. Scoring 275 in the second round puts Claire back in the game and gives her another chance at keeping her title. Another high score in the third and final round will predict whether or not Claire will get to keep her status as world champion. 74.5. 300. <laughs> Although the results continue to be revealed, the points of Claire's last two rounds have made her a clear winner. And so the celebrations begin. After making some last-minute adjustments, Claire is welcomed on stage as the under-21 2011 World Champion. Let's welcome on stage the 2011 World Champion from the Hessian School in Connacht, Ireland, Claire Greedy. I actually don't even know what to say. It just feels amazing and I'm just relieved to be done and it's all gone well. It's my five in a row, so fifth year winning it, and I cannot believe it. I feel unbelievable. I couldn't stop crying through that. I don't know, I think it was just the relief and um, just the emotion of actually knowing I'm okay. five in a row. After showing off her new trophy, Claire and all her supporters finished the evening in true Galway tradition. If you ever go across the sea to Ireland, if it's only at the closing of your day, or to see again the moon rise over Clara and watch the sun go down on Galway Bay.